Hello, and welcome to the Full of Ship podcast. Real answers to real problems. With your host, Kyle Henderson, CEO and co-founder of Vision API, a podcast dedicated to demystify the chaotic, often turbulent world of ocean freight. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of Full of Ship. I'm your host, Kyle Henderson. And today we have Hannah Testani, the CEO of Intelligent Audit, who is joining our conversation today. Hannah, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for joining. Nice to ha- nice to meet you, and thanks for having me on Full of Ship. Hopefully, I'm saying that wrong. At any point. <laughs> you're saying or you're saying it correct <laughs> with, with a wry smile. That's the appropriate way. <laughs> so, could uh, for our listeners to get to know you a bit better, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your career in logistics? Of the story of intelligent audit, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have been around this space for probably about 20 years now. So um, I say I grew up around it. So my dad actually started the company um, in 97. So I was, to, to, to tell my age, I was eight or was nine then. Um, and really at the core where we started was managing parcel audits. So our first customer was Warner Home Video back when they were shipping cassettes. You know, for, if anyone remembers what those are. And they had asked us to take their data and for them to get paid by by the delivery points, they need to get the, the POD. So we captured the delivery, gave it to them, and uh, the rest is kind of history. About 10 years ago, we evolved to doing all modes. So the, the cool thing about our structure is we were set up foundationally to handle mass amounts of parcel data, um, which has you know since been been tremendous for us as a company. And and from there, going from parcel where you could have a company ship you know 100 million shipments a year to going on the freight side where maybe a company ships 100,000 shipments a year in containers and and full chocolates that's extremely rare. So. Because of that, we've been able to, at scale, really evolve our mission statement, which is to work with shippers to help them become smarter. And we define that as shipping to their customers faster, cheaper, and with less exceptions to their customers. And I would say how we've worked with customers has also evolved. I like to say all the disruptions to shippers And the harder their lives are, the the better it is for us, because that's where we can shine. We're able to take mass amounts of data across all modes. So whether it's parcel, LTL, chocolate, intermodal, air, ocean, rail, we can take all of that data. We ingest it electronically. We then normalize it. So we cleanse things like names, addresses, charges, and then truly transform into actionable intelligence. And that's been the name of the game, right? The when it's a shipper market, which is what, sorry, when it's a carrier market, which is what we've been in the past almost two years now, and shippers have almost almost no leverage, and they're just kind of scrambling to get by. And every day we just throw more bombs at them, and they're like, "All right, like, gotta figure this out." They rely on people like us, so it's our technology and our people that really help them continue to be effective and, frankly, get shipments out the door. So. You know, we want them to be done in the, the fastest, cheapest, and best experience of their customers. But we also want to make sure the shipments are being able to be moved out. And, you know, the, the shifting from just-in-time to just-in-case inventory has done a lot for us and how we partner with our customers to truly help them be able to generate revenue at, at a company level. Curious, and I'm only asking this because I'm a, kind of a tech nerd. How has the technology at the company changed from 97 to 2007 to 2017? You know, what's the evolution been? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot. So it's, it's actually a funny story. Um, you know, when the company was started, um, our servers were at our house. And I remember at one point, my my mom asked my dad to, to get security in the house or just like a, an alarm system. And he was a great idea. And he only got the one room where the servers were alarmed and nothing else in the house had an alarm. And then she found that out a few years later and, and went crazy. But um, where are the servers? I mean, you know, 15 years on, they've probably been in a, in a data center. But overall, the actual tech stack has continued to change, right? So we've continued to stay in the latest and greatest in terms of what languages we're using, how we're managing data. You know, we've we've been smart in terms of how we can create data lakes that 
you know, give our customers access to all of their data um, in, in a quick amount of time. So, you know, you can come in, you can ship, you know, half a billion dollars a year in your spend and within seconds get everything real time. So, you know, we've been good at keeping up. I would say the hardest thing to keep up has been InfoSec. So, you know, we continue to invest there and we continue to, to see what's out there, but it is crazy. Um, you know, like we, we get phishing emails, like I get them every single week by our company and it is so impressive. Like I almost always think like, I'm like, oh, this is, this must be, a, this must be one that was, that, I, that they're, they're trying to get me on. And then if you click it, it'll say, congratulations, this, you know, you, you, you passed. It was a simulator uh, or a simulation, but many times I click and they're like, oh, good job. Like people like you help us get stronger. So like the, the, the phishing that is out there that, that gets People who are sophisticated and then not sophisticated. It's just like, it is so impressive. So um, I would say there's always room to, to get better there. And that's probably what always scares me the most. But overall, I'd say um, we've been pretty good at adapting. So in my notes here, I have that Intelligent Audit is a certified women's business enterprise. Uh, I think the acronym is pronounced WeBank. Is that correct? That is correct. Um so we, what does that mean? Yeah, what what is a women's business enterprise? And I guess how do you get certified in it? Yeah, it's a it's a, a great question. So you know, we um, up until five years ago, Intelligent Audit never had sales and marketing. So we invested in that. We decided that we wanted to have people that that work for us that sell our solution. And until then, we just had a bunch of referral partners, and everyone would do you know, their solution, and they would tag ours on. So I, with, with that, I started to go out and, and meet a lot of people. And every time I'd be out talking to generally middle-aged white guys, but you know the, the, there's a little bit of diversity there, although not much, they'd always say, you know, I would get so much credit if you were the CEO and you could become WeBank. And I was like, that's great. I have a Russian father and I have an older brother who works at the company. Um, so the likelihood that he would ever give me that title, even though he gave me all the responsibility, um, was just very unlikely. So I, I told my dad a few years ago, I was like, you've given me all the responsibility. I want the title. And, and he said, he was like, the industry wouldn't take you seriously and the company seriously because you're too young. Um, and I was, and you're a woman. And I was like, I was like, like, let me prove you wrong. So I did it. I was successful. And then I remember going back to him and I'm like, well, like, let's do it. And he was like, no, no, you, you were able to be successful because you're a woman. I was like, that's not fair. I was like, you can't have it both ways. So, so finally, um, became CEO last February. So just about a year ago. And then, uh, in addition to that, we did a lot of, of engineering and structuring to become women owned. So um, now I am president of our of our board. I do have uh, the, all the voting control, and you know it's been it's been cool. Um, we announced it in November, and interestingly, right after we announced that we were women owned, um, a, a well known uh, reporter sent me a, a text, and he was like, "Why would you want to announce and publish that you're women owned?" Like you're He's like, Hannah, your all your competitors are probably almost double your age, and they're middle aged white guys, middle aged white guys, and you're selling to middle aged white guys. And I was like, okay, like I I can see how I'm different, <laughs> and how I might not fit the bill, but I think that being different and being innovative is what's going to to help shippers, you know, think differently and get out of the rut that they've been in. And and honestly, I don't, I can't think of many shippers who are our customers who are happy with their providers. So I was like, oh, I was like, oh, I take the criticism, but like, watch me, watch me show that there's, it's, it's a positive. And if being WeBank is also something that really helps large enterprise companies achieve their commitments to, you know, to the government, then why not get credit for it? So um, it's, it's been short, right? It's only been three months, but um, I've been enjoying it. And um, uh, it's very funny that you, you kept receiving that that kind of question or that comment that, uh, you know, that people thought it was going to hurt you in some sense. But I, I wonder, like, 
you know, if you ask them in 10 years from now, how many of these companies do you think will have women in leadership? How many of these companies will you be buying from a female, et cetera? You know, I, what do you think they would say? Would they like, you know, oh, a, a fair number, no more than today. <laughs> Something to that effect, right? Like, okay, if, if it's more than today, then then what do you think tomorrow has to look like? Tomorrow has to look like what is in front of you right now if you think it's going to be different 10 years, five years from now. Like, uh, yeah. it's, it's just weird. Yeah, I get, there's just like this double-sided thing I hear so often where it's like people expect things to change, but they don't want them to change at the same time. Right. It's, it's a very interesting, interesting situation. Yeah. Um, it's got to start somewhere. And, you know, I think that it's, there's a lot to it, right? I mean, in general, I think that people, it's, it's easy to relate to someone that is similar to you, whatever similar is. And, and it can definitely be something that is negative, but at the same time, people also like some people also like the illusion of things that are new to them. It's a new concept. And, you know, I've been able to kind of reap the benefit of that, but I do hope. And I, and I think that it's not, we're not far from, you know, walking into, you know, boardrooms and, and having more diversity, not because they have to, but because it just makes sense, right? Because it represents the company and, it represents their customers. So um, I was at a show a couple of weeks ago, BGSA, and for the most part, it's executives that are in the mm-hmm. transportation space and also technology. And and we're, we're in the middle, right? We're tech and, and we're in the logistics space. And um, I said, I was like, guys, there's 300 men in the room. There's any, the, the person who put it on was like, well, there's 15 women. And I was like, okay, like 15 women. And I was just like, we got to get better than this. Like, yeah, and you, you know the, like, he, the population ratio is 50-50 roughly. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's not their fault. And it's like, that's why I don't say, like, it is no one's fault that it's not more diverse. I I think that it's just, like, we as women, I think, need to be better at at proving ourselves. Like, it's going to be harder, but do it. And and work harder and prove and, and want it. Like, if you want it and you're hungry, you'll get it. So I just think if we pretend like we don't have anything holding us down, then we'll break it. You know, we'll, we'll break an invisible, um, you know, glass ceiling ahead of us. And, and that's what I think it is. I, you know, I have, I have three kids, two girls, and, you know, they, they don't really know what I do, but they know that I usually talk to a lot of people. And, and I've, I've asked them many times, like, what do they want to be? And they want to be anything, right? So at a young age, you're not taught that you can't do what you want to do. That's learned. You know, that's learned by, by your surroundings. And um, it's just, it's a, it's a long t- culture, but we'll get there. And I think that in 10 years, uh, hopefully there'll be, um, there'll be a, a, a much more representative crowd um, at these, in the, in this sector. Curious, how much do you get into conversations around diversity and not, not to be too nuts and bolts about it, but the kind of ROI on prioritizing diversity? you know, everyone, everyone's got to do it now. Um, so everyone's trying to figure out how to do it. Um, you know, honestly, the problem is there's not enough talent, you know, and, and, and that's why I think that people who are diverse need to step up, you know, do, do better, invest in yourself. Um, you're wanted. So, you know, if you just make yourself known, if, if you prove that you can do it, then, then the opportunities are out there. So, you know, I generally don't spend a lot of time talking about it. You know, becoming WeBank, I spend more, but I'm always like, ignore the fact that I'm a woman. Like, treat me like I'm not. And then let's talk. Like, let's have a conversation because I know that our product is the best. I know our team is the best. That's it. You know, I don't need to do anything else. And we've also been growing really well. So it's not like I need to be like, give me a chance because I'm different. I'm saying give me a chance because I'm the best. And I just happen to be different. So a lot of change is happening uh, in all sorts of ways in our space, in our companies, in our industry. But I'm kind of curious on your perspective. Often our customers or people we encounter in the market, you know, they see my company vision. They see, oh, what you do is simple, simple to understand. You give me the tracking events for my containerized freight. And I imagine it can be something similar for intelligent audit. Oh, you give me proof of deliveries. So there's this like fundamental, like just most basic use case and value case around what we offer. But I'm curious of your customer base in the market, 
how have you seen the understanding evolve that there's more to this data than just that basic use case? There's more business intelligence. There's more operational efficiency that can be built off of this data. You know, is that yeah. just starting? Has it been going on a while? How, how has it you know, framed up from your perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, our core is we're a freight audit company. You know, that's that's how we started. Um, you know, and, and foundationally, we we audit carrier invoices. Um, probably about maybe about ten years ago, maybe more, twelve years ago, we evolved because we saw that we were sitting on this gold mine of data. We have all the information that shows everything about where companies are shipping to, their costs everything in transit. And we saw the opportunity to really take this information and, and first help our customers visualize it in, in, a, in a business intelligence platform. So we developed it our own, we developed our own tool, it's proprietary, and it's a it's extremely robust at giving customers access to their data. And there was that was probably the first shift that I would say we, we saw an opportunity to to really enhance what we're doing for our customers. Then the next shift that I'd say has been happening the last couple of years is you have all my data. You know how, how to show it to me in a really, really cool way, many cool ways. But now provide me with actionable intelligence. So tell me what I should have been done, should should have should be doing, what can I be doing that's better? And that's where there's been a continued shift of just optimization, continued optimization of where were you today? Where were you yesterday? Where should you be going to be? And, you know, all of our customers – you know, are, are, are really tackled within supply chain in the future. You can no longer have Excel be your number one technology. You know, it's not a technology that, that is efficient at running your supply chain, but it is, right? Everyone tracks everything in Excel and it just, it's so inefficient. And so, you know, I think that if, from a shipper's perspective, as they embrace and say, okay, well, how do I take on my trans spend globally? You, you need a data source. You need a system that takes the information, again, globally, all modes, normalizes the internet and produces the actionable intelligence. So it's not really three pillars. It's the audit, it's it's the visualization, and then it's the actionable intelligence. And both the latter two were, I would say, are the two pillars that have thus changed our, our company foundationally since its inception. Additionally, from your perspective and over the past two years of the new normal, uh, you work with a number of Fortune 500 brands. You get to connect with a lot of executives. From your perspective, who has been hurting and who has been gaining or winning in the last two years uh, across the industry? Uh, I'm imagining you have a, a very particular view in it because you get to see all the fights over who pays who <laughs> in some sense. But I'm kind of curious, like, you know, who have been the winners and losers from the perspective of intelligent audit in the marketplace you know, by types of companies, not specific companies? It's a great time to be a carrier, first and foremost. Um, and, you know, it's a capitalist society. And, you know, I think that shippers you know, are quick to forget that for a long time it was a shipper market and they were just negotiating carriers all day long and better rates. And the carriers had to in turn say, okay, well, if I can't compete on cost, what else can I do? And it was, you know, time and transit, it was performance, and there was flexibility. And then now it's the opposite. So there's the carriers, you know, it's, it is their world. They will price what they want. They will deliver it when they want. And, you know, many carriers are charging significantly more than they used to charge and delivering much more service. At the same time, shippers could not ship products. There was there was no one who could move those services for them. I mean, luckily, I think that that has subsided um, for many, uh, but it's still an active issue depending on the mode, you know, ocean, truckload, LTL. There's still, an, and there's still a capacity crunch. Um, on parcel, I would say it's, it's, it's leveled out and um, anyone who wants to ship can. Um, almost every carrier this past peak was like, give me more, give me more, like whatever you can, I'm ready. But that just wasn't the case in other modes. So I would say in general, um, the the biggest losers were shippers. And then from there, the shippers that lost the most were companies that focused on just-in-time delivery, as well as retailers. The you know the more companies that uh, that were delivering direct to consumers, and especially residential locations, because that's where the carriers really pinpointed the most aggressively in their in their peak fees. You know, 
it's one thing to increase an ocean container charge, right? Because it's spread out across so many different items. And same with LTL and truckload, but parcel is such a big portion of the end cost for a shipment that if you go, it goes up by three, four bucks for me, that's a lot of money. And that's what's been happening. So um, I think the biggest losers are any any company that ships residential locations. The biggest winners from a shipper's perspective are companies that ship to businesses because that's, that's the most attractive, right? The carriers like delivery density. The more shipments to a location, the better for them. And unfortunately, that's just a, that to make commercial more more attractive than residential. What do you think the uh, the cargo owners have learned by this recent swing to advantage the carriers? And how do you think the cargo owners are going to behave differently in the future? Yeah. I mean, if I was them right now and I'm just sitting on so much more cash, I'd be investing into more automation because although it's a great time to, to be them, they're also struggling with labor capacity. And that's it's a real issue where they want to take more, but they just can't. There's no one to do that for them. So um, I would say that, you know, now's the time to be thinking about the automation and there's a huge delay in being able to implement any kind of, you know, automation in your warehouses, you know, DCs or uh, anywhere else in your, in your processes. So to even find, uh, find the person that could implement that is a delay um, and they need to be trained and they need to be caught up. So I would say to, to think through that and, you know, to think through where they want to be when, when the market shifts, because it will shift. And I think that the next shift is one that's going to last a long time because shippers have been forced to really rethink their supply chain and diversify. And, you know, whereas before it was just easy to say, you know, I'm going to use one carrier for a lane or for one region because it's just easy. I can give them all my shipments. You know, why not? Now they've had to rethink everything. Blank canvas. Who can I use? How can I get it to them? How can I help them pick up for me? How can I help them deliver for me? So the next time it shifts to a shipper's world, they're going to have so much more leverage. And I'm a huge believer in informational asymmetry. And whoever sits on the asymmetric portion is winning. You know, when when Kayak introduced their services, the reason why everyone was a huge fan of them is because it gave you transparency to, to airfare across everything. And the information asymmetry shifted from the carriers to the consumers, and it became, you know, um, uh, more flat. So, to me, right now the carriers just have more information than, than they've ever had before and more power. But at the same time, shippers now are saying, okay, well, who else is going to use? How do I innovate? How do I think through this? And getting them more, and they're getting more creative, and it's it's going to be in their advantage once that shifts. So, hopefully, if I if I was a carrier now, what I would be doing is finding strategic partners with customers um, and building long standing relationships because people remember and people respect. And, you know, if you can, if you can commit to somebody long term, then I think it's going to be effective for them when that shift happens. So uh, would you say you see that happening with looking at some of these carriers who are acquiring, oh, ex- let's say Maersk, for example, Acquiring first mile, last mile, uh, acquiring more of the verticalized, full logistics solution, acting more like a 3PL than just an ocean carrier. Is that kind of an example of what you're saying you expect the change to be? I mean, someone like Maersk was just sitting on so much cash after last year because it's a great time to be Maersk that they had to spend it somewhere, right? You can't just sit on this money. So, you know, if, if I'm them, it's you know, how else can I better service my customers? And then how can I get anyone else that's that's interfering with me and my customers out of the mix? And if they could own that, it makes sense. So um, I think in general, the more you can own, the the more control you have, and that's always attractive. So um, with with any, you know, someone like Amersk, I, I see them continuing to to purchase any any product or service offering that stands between the shipper and them any which way it does. And it, it makes sense, right? They can they can profit off more of it and they can own more of it. How do you think the carriers are thinking about like digital visibility going forward? Uh, how much is it a threat to them? How much is it an opportunity to them? You know, in some sense, you know, there's that, <laughs> it's kind of funny, there's that classic phrase of like, you know, visibility, whether on like the tracking events or on the proof of delivery, 
it's one of those problems that shouldn't exist, I hear quite often, but it does exist and exists because of a number of decisions a long time ago. Uh, how do you think the carriers are looking at this position of power they're in right now, but digitization may water down their advantages, but digitization is also going to need to will be the differentiator that helps them build their their next generation of customer profile. Yeah, I, I guess who's doing well and who's doing poorly. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say two things. And the first I'll say is we've become much more transparent with what we can see, right? I mean, there's, there's companies like yours that exist that provide transparency to customers. And it really hasn't changed the carrier's desire to perform better. But you, you're not keeping them accountable. And and shippers are saying, well, here's your cost. Here's your on-time performance. Here's your time in transit. And they know that information. And I don't think that they're ready to change upon it because they don't need to because it's their market. Eventually, they'll have to. And I think that, you know, the, the companies that perform well will tout it. And they'll say, well, look at my performance. Track me anywhere. Like, Wave the white flag. You'll see I'm the best. And companies who don't, <laughs> won't. Um, you know, they'll, they'll hide that. And, and they'll become the cheap carrier who you can't rely on. You know, like for, for a long time, that was someone like a USPS. You think about the parcel market. For a long time, you know, you can take a tracking number and you can track it. At any given point and see where a shipment was. And um, that worked for UPS, FedEx, DHL, USPS. But with USPS... There's not that much information. They just don't provide it. They don't show it to anyone. Did it change people from using them? No. People still use them, knowing that it was going to be a worse service. So, um, you know, I think data is powerful and data is useful. And most shippers will leverage it. They're going to say, you know what? It's important to me because I care about my commitments to my company and my customers. And they're going to come in and they're going to say, okay, I'm only going to select carriers who've met these thresholds. And there's going to be some that say, I don't care. Just get to me whenever I can and I'll be happy. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll kind of see the, the tale of, of two cities there. Earlier, you were talking about the investment that your company, Intelligent Audit, has made into data quality assuring data quality, uh, leveling, raising the bar on data quality, such as, you know, normalization, analysis. And you mentioned for the end purpose of giving actionable insights. Curious, what are what are the hot actionable insights that your customers are excited about and, you know, buying from you today? Yeah, and I'll say um, data in this space is just so noisy because there's so many inputs to it. And you know, carrier invoices are probably the cleanest, whereas TMS data can be real garbage. You know, you can just shove in anything and, and get the shipment information to us. And and that's that's always been the hardest because our customers keep Sorry, us accountable. Curious. Why, why do you think the TMS data is so much lower quality than the invoice data? There's no bounds to it. There's 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 no structure. It's it's there's a lot of just open entry fields and there's there's not a lot of, of communication with any two companies that clean it. Whereas carrier invoices go through structured processes to cleanse it. There's still a noise and there's a lot of you know, like no one says about Walmart examples, but for the most part it's clean and structured. You're not gonna get a charge cost in, in a zip field, you know, a zip code. Um TMS data, it's a wild, wild west. It's like, just shove it in there, push it out, and then, you know, use it. And that's been a problem for us in the past because our customers come to us and say, well, you're showing it. It's your reporting. And it's like, yeah, but it's because you sent us bad data. So we can no longer say that, right? So now we've had to put in a lot of parameters that say, you know, these are the different, you know, data elements. These are, these are the options. And if we don't get one of these options, we're going to create rules to cleanse it. So you can't come into our system and see a truckload shipment from China into Mexico and then say, hey, Anna, why is that? Why is that truckload? It's obviously ocean. And then I'm like, well, you gave me. You gave it to me. So, right. So that can no longer exist. So in terms of how we reduce actionable intelligence, there's a lot of great nuggets. Um, the easy ones to me, I think one of them is, 
is showing customers where they're paying for dead space. So we get all the dimensions for shipments. We have the actual weight, the build weight, the delta there is what they're paying for that dead space. And, and we can show that to our customers. And that's an opportunity that is on them to fix. That is not a carrier issue. That is a them issue. Um, others are consolidation, whether it's going from parcel to LTL or an easy one, which is really common, shipping multiple shipments out on the same day to the same location from the same location. And, you know, it's it's two things. First of all, it's costly. Second of all, it's it's not green. And I tell our customers, if, if you don't care about the cost, which most of them do, but if you don't work with your marketing team to get the budget to fix it by talking about the green impact, raising your carbon footprint, because that is a hot conversation. And you say, you know, if you invest in, you know, this technology from an OMS perspective, which is order management system, then you'll be able to reach your carbon footprint by 10%. And companies go crazy over that. So that's another easy one. Um, in general, using the right parse, the right sorry, the right carrier in the right lane or the right mode, the right service. There's a lot of emotional decisions there where people say, you know, I just don't like carrier X Y Z. I don't use them. And we go back and we say, well, you know, I don't care. I don't care about your emotions. Here's the data. Based on the data, this carrier underperformed when that you wanted. They they were much more expensive, and they were lower time in transit, or they were higher time in transit. So. Here's what the data shows. And now let's figure out with you if, if you think you should continue doing what you're doing. So there's so much opportunity when you see data um, and, and our ability to take customer's information, regardless who it is, and run through a system and have the system tell us the opportunities to optimize are pretty special. I think this might be my last question, but there's you know, a huge amount of investment in today's market. And I've heard, you know, you continue to put more focus on automation technology, et cetera, to build those intelligent insights. You know, can you tell us maybe like, you know, what's coming next for intelligent audit or maybe what do you think is coming next in the freight audit space? Like what's, what's your predictions for what's happening in the next 12 months or so? Yeah, I would say in the freight audit space, there's been a lot of consolidation. You know, frankly, um, most of our competitors do what we do, but they do it manually. They literally like audit invoices, I think one by one. And, you know, we do that all systematically. I would say what we're investing more is in in true machine learning and true AI. We used to use Twitter-based algorithms, which were good at detecting anomalous patterns. But at the same time, it was too much noise. It would It would have too many false positives. So we hired a lead data scientist, his name is Brian Pollack, out of the healthcare space, where he was, you know, doing great research on, I think, fatty liver disease and how to detect it using um, using scans before a person can. So um, I, know, I knew him in the past, and, and we hired him on to lead our data science team. And he's introduced us to deep learning models, which uses long, short-term bucketing to be able to find an anomalous pattern. And our customer is aware of it. So these are not audit issues. These are true anomalous behaviors that are occurring mostly because of human error or, or a technology glitch or because they didn't know the impact of it. So we're about to release a case study for Petco, which I can speak about. But, you know, they they made this change from ground service to SurePost. And SurePost goes to USPS, it's a cheaper service. But it's a thing to save considerable amounts of money per shipment. And our system didn't know that they were planning on doing that. And it raised an anomalous alert because their cost per shipment went up. And it went up because they were giving UPS bad shipment weight information. And when you give UPS bad weight information, they charge you a penalty, $1 per shipment. And it happened to be higher for SurePost than any other service. So our, our system said there's an alert. Something is going wrong for Petco. Their cost per shipment is spiking. Here's why. And it's the speed that we can do that. And then the prescriptive way that we're saying, here's what's causing it. And now helping our companies resolve it. And there's just no way a person can detect that. There's just, you'd have to have known to break it up into one DC, to one shipper account. And then within that, the spike was huge, but at a macro level, it wasn't, right? I mean, if you're shipping $100 million a year, a spike of a million dollars is not going to be significant because it's it's there's just so much data. 
But the system is able to go down at a much more granular level and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. We've never seen this before. Let's raise the alert. So it just continued to investment in true machine learning to be able to do um, anomalous patterns. And um, we're rolling that out to our customers now. We've been beta testing that for a few months. And it's been really effective at finding issues before any other system can, any other person can. And now we're, we're not going to apply that to, um, to real-time visibility for, for parcel, for example. So if a shipment misses a scan, what is the likelihood it's going to be delivered past the commitment time? Um, on the LTL, you know, same thing. If, if this doesn't happen or if this does happen, it's an exception. What is the percentage likelihood that it will not be delivered on the commitment time? And then make our customers aware so they can tell their customers preemptively. So it's exciting. There's a lot. You know, there's a lot of innovation that we can do here. And um, I don't think any of our competitors are thinking about anything to this magnitude. So, um, you know, we continue to just be be pushing the industry towards a, towards a better standard. Well, Hannah, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to speak with you, learning more about intelligent audit, learning more about the freight audit space, because it's not a space I've been super familiar with. But uh, again, thank you for your time, all the listeners. This is Hannah Testani, the CEO of Intelligent Audit. Uh, any last thoughts, comments, or questions you have for our audience? Thank you for listening. I mean, it's interesting because now people know what we do, right? For a long time, I'd say I was in a our first supply chain tech company, and they were like, oh, that's fun. And they would kind of move around with the next person. And now they're like, yeah, like, it just, it affects everyone personally. They're like, oh, I couldn't get my fridge. It was two months delayed. Or like, I heard something a while ago and it's still not delivered. So it's fun and it's cool to be relevant. And um, hopefully you hear less about supply chain in the news because we've all been able to to get a good handle on, a, on inventory and um, customer experience. But thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to be your guest. Yeah, our pleasure to have you as well. Again, this is Full of Ship with Hannah Testani of Intelligent Audit. Thank you for listening and catch you next time. Thank you for joining Kyle and his guest on the Full of Ship podcast. Be sure to subscribe and tune in next time as Kyle continues to demystify ocean carrier tracking with his future guests.